It points to something important that I think games can offer, which is to let you live in the skin of someone else, someone who perceives the world very differently to most of us and understand what they're going through in a way that no amount of reading about the subject um, can do. If we could get the player into the headspace of this very singular character, we will have achieved, here it comes, empathy. Live in the skin of someone else. Here it comes, empathy. Live in the skin of someone else. Empathy. Live in the skin of someone else. Empathy. Live in the skin of someone else. Empathy. I've heard games described as machines for empathy numerous times, with increasing frequency over the last few years. The argument being that through the wonderful, unique, special magic of video games, players can experience the lives of others. To simulate a virtual mile in their shoes, so to speak, and through that, be engendered with a greater capacity for empathy. I, to be blunt, think this is total, complete and utter shite. If I sound like I'm being harsh, let me assure you it's only because I'm going to spend the rest of this video being incredibly earnest. To explain why I disdain the term empathy machine so much, I'm going to talk about a video game with more merit to the idea of empathetic design than most. That's right, I'm going to be talking about the cat game. No, not that one the best one. There is a TV ad released in Japan right before the release of The Last Guardian that captures something of the emotional longing for this game, which spent nine years in development. It's a lovely wee commercial. A man stopped in the street as this part of themselves that they had forgotten is awoken when they find out that The Last Guardian is finally coming out. God, if it wasn't how I felt. It doesn't feel schmaltzy, but appropriate for the fact that the games of the now dissolved Team Eco, The Last Guardian completed under the now equally defunct Japan Studio, are special. In my previous video on Shadow of the Colossus, I described their works as feeling like they came from a parallel universe where the priorities of the medium were wildly different, where emotional experience and themes were emphasised over power fantasies and gratification. With a long nine year wait, during which big budget games seemed to become increasingly commodified, The Last Guardian was a promise something different. Something better. The Last Guardian begins with our protagonist, an unnamed boy awaking in a cave. He's not alone. With him is a huge griffin cat dog thing chained nearby. Howling in pain, the player's attention is quickly drawn to an object embedded in its leg. The moment is clearly inspired by the fable of Androcles and the lion, in which an escaped slave forms an unlikely bond with a ferocious lion by removing a thorn from its paw. An act of mercy, the lion ultimately returns later in the story. Trico and the boy share that same bond. The act of removing spears is one you'll repeat, nursing the creature's wounds after every fight, with no prompting from the game or Trico. Tell someone who played this game you never once helped remove those spears and see the look of disgust and contempt they'll give you. Conjuring up that strong reaction to Trico's pain is the sum of nine years of work, combining animation, AI, sound design and physics into a fully realised creature. Even six years after its release, Trico remains not only convincing, but an absolute marvel. The sense of weight as he clambers around the sprawling fortress, or the way his breathing is not just visible, but reflective of his say. I don't think this level of fidelity is necessary to bond a player to an NPC. After all, Team Eco's two previous games did it with much less at work. Yet the nuance in Trico, the small details that reflect a range of moods and feelings, allow him to be a fully emoting creature. 
without ever dipping into the uncanny valley that plagues realistic virtual humans. And something I really appreciate is that Trico is clearly drawn from a study of real animals. He never feels cartoonish or goofy. His movement and features make him a wholly convincing animal, despite being a mythical beast. As the boy, players must cooperate with Trico to overcome obstacles and escape the nest, a vast crumbling fortress the two have found themselves mysteriously trapped within. At his size, the boy is able to get through gaps and use the nest's aging mechanisms, while Trico can leap great chasms and help the boy reach higher ledges. And Trico is so impressive as you navigate this intricate world that it's easy to overlook the impressive work gone into the boy too. His childlike running and jumping make him believable as a young protagonist in way over their head, prone to stumbling and struggling to hoist themselves onto ledges. Neither of them are perfectly capable alone and the game goes to great pains to outline their weaknesses. For the boy, the danger is grave. He can easily fall to his death or be snatched up by the nest's enchanted sentries who drag him off to an unknown, sinister dim. He's a child facing real peril. For Trico, the weaknesses are typically much more indirect. While the sentries can harm him with spears and swords, there's never a sense they can actually kill him. Though that doesn't make you want to see him get hurt any less. Instead, Trico is sometimes undermined by his great size, trapped in small rooms or caverns. Yet his greatest weakness is the stained glass eye that litters the fortress. While there's very little exposition in the game, it's abundantly clear that Trico is an abused animal, formerly subservient to whoever ruled the nest. And these eyes seem like deliberate conditioning to control Trico, to keep him under the nest's authority. As a boy, you'll have to destroy and remove these for Trico to feel safe to proceed. That's the dynamic. A young boy far from home helping a wounded, abused animal overcome the trauma that has left it a prisoner. So, how do they manage it? One of the most basic and widely understood trust exercises in existence is falling and letting someone catch you. It's fundamental because it asks you to put yourself at obvious risk, to make yourself vulnerable. It's a great foundation for The Last Guardian. While the earliest portions of the game are establishing the basics of how the boy and Trico can complement each other, soon enough you hit a pivotal point when trying to cross a bridge. As you remove one of the stained glass eyes Trico fears so much, the platform begins to collapse around you. There's no way back. It's too small for Trico to come and get you. So, with no verbal confirmation or promise, you have to sprint, leap, and hope that he will catch you. And to be clear, Trico can absolutely fail to catch you. I've had it happen once or twice on playthroughs. That fallibility was something several critics took issue with, citing Trico's unreliability as a flaw in the game. And while I wholly sympathise with critics rushing to deadlines, struggling with a cat, bird, griven things, innate animal nature, that fallibility is so vital to the game's themes. If there's no risk of failure, no faith is required. If Trico always does things perfectly, is always there, and can always do what you need him to, you don't have anything resembling an actual relationship. You have a servant or underling there to do your bidding. The Last Guardian isn't about empathy. It's about allowing yourself to be vulnerable. It is about overcoming heart and opening yourself up to the compassion of others. It's what you're asking Trico to do as you coax him through the ruins of the nest. So why shouldn't you have to do the same? You have to take a leap of faith and hope that someone will catch you. A lot of the game revolves around this exercise, for both characters. Trico has to make leaps into perilous spots, hoping that the boy will be there to find a solution to get them out. Far enough into the game, Trico will follow you into spaces like this cramped mineshaft, assured that you can help them get through somehow. I can't describe how much the thought of letting Trico down pains me. 
especially because of what he overcomes to help you as well. The aforementioned stained glass eyes play a vital role in their journey together, giving the boy a clear strength Trico lacks. Yet this is eventually tested when the boy will be grabbed by sentries and Trico is kept at bay by the eyes. When I got to this sequence, I figured, fuck, I'd messed up, and it was up to me to find a solution. However, at a few possible moments in the game, if your bond is strong enough, upon seeing the boy in need of his help, Trico will overcome his fear and leap forward, through the glass, to the rescue. Learning to rely on Trico requires subverting traditional video game expectations where the player is the centre of the universe and nothing happens without their input. By having the success of sequences rely on Trico, we are forced to give ourselves over to these leaps of faith, something the game increasingly asks of us even as the boy becomes more capable. But that trust also has to be tested. Deep in the ruins are these chambers where magical forces seize control of Trico, turning him against the boy. As mentioned, the idea is that Trico is a traumatised animal, and so it's perfectly natural for there to be moments where these harmful experiences resurface. Eventually it is revealed that Trico is not entirely innocent and in how the boy came to be in this strange place. these pivotal moments, where Trico has seemingly eaten the boy, we get a flashback that shows several key things. Firstly, that Trico can indeed fly. Second, we learn he kidnapped the boy, as seemingly ordered to by whatever rules the nest, only when chance intervenes, lightning striking him down on his return flight, as the boy spared whatever fate awaited. Again, like all times previous, the boy is released, but this time, it might be too late. And so, for several minutes, we can do nothing but watch as Chico tries to find a way to save him. There are a few sequences in the game like this, but none so long as this one. Back and forth he wonders, trying things out, and by God if you're not convinced there's real thinking going on behind those big, adorable eyes. Clear as day, the game illustrates his autonomy, establishing Trico as your counterpart solving puzzles while you're not there. Eventually, he revives the boy, and you get to give him a big pet for being such a good, brave boy. This is the other half of what the game is aiming to impart, about respecting Trico's autonomy, to not only trust him, but accept that he has his own agency. Again, many took issue with being forced to rely on this animal, which did not readily obey commands. But that's precisely what is so central to the themes of the game, it is asking players to treat Trico, in contrast to so many video game NPCs, as a real, living equal. By the time you reach the skyscraping tower at the top of the nest again, Trico's wings are almost fully grown back, and with the boy's help, a runway is put together, giving them a chance at a perilous test flight. It's the only way to reach the tower, the only way out. Everything has been building to this. This is it. Magnificent triumph that's nonetheless underscored with a little sadness, as deep down, the player, and perhaps even the boy, must know that this marks the beginning of the end for their adventure. Together the two fight tooth and nail up the tower. For most players there will be incredible synergy between the duo, taking them from helpless in the face of the sentries to leading an all-out assault against their greatest bastion. Yet as you begin this final ascent, something strange is afoot. Even from the outside, the architecture has shifted. The tower is like no other building in the valley. Inside, an eerie chill covers the floor in a cool mist. 
The boy's breath catches in the air. Near the top sits a core, a structure nestled near the roof beneath a massive turning fan. Inside is a spinning, glowing construction, an artificial brain, the master of the valley. And just what is the master of the valley? Well, it's a computer. From the cold, sterile interior and worrying cooling fan, it's quite explicit what the game's villain represents. The architect and authority of a vast, controlling system. On the roof, Trico and the boy share one last peaceful moment together, before the end. A respite for them and the player to think back on the journey taken. It's interrupted by this master of the valley, calling the other creatures home with their prizes. The kidnapped boys, we learn, are basically magically digested, turned into fuel to feed the creatures like Trico as well as their master. In another life, things are no different for our protagonists. It's only luck that has fostered the circumstances in which their bond can be forged. Chance encounters and meetings of strangers, the last guardian seems to argue, is essential in expanding our capacity as humans for considering others. Discomfort and vulnerability are the requirements for growth. If the system ran as it was intended to, without friction, there would be no heartwarming story. In one of the game's most upsetting sequences, Draco's brethren set upon him, and we must watch helplessly. Eventually, the boy takes the mirror they've been carrying the whole game and uses it to destroy the master of the valley. It nearly kills them, but Trico is saved. With its last bit of strength, fearing for its friend's life, it is the one thing you've been waiting the whole game for. In the village, as you might expect, a hostile reception is waiting. Even when the boy returned, the humans don't trust the beast. They don't know it like you do. Here with the boy home, and Trico able to fly, their relationship has come to its inevitable end. And so there is only one thing left to do. The one thing the master of the valley would never do. The one thing games seldom encourage us to do. We let them go. In her 29 essay, The Banality of Empathy, writer Namwali Serpel challenges the traditional reading of art as a means to stimulate empathy. Using the example of interactive Black Mirror episode Bandersnatch, an example very relevant to discussing games as empathy machines, she describes how the work almost had the exact opposite effect. She says, My empathy for the hero was completely at my odds with the desire to watch Black Mirror, that is, to indulge in an often violent and therefore titillating TV show about the horrors of technology. This gave lie to the idea that I had any genuine empathy for this white dude at all. I wasn't there to feel his pain. I was there to impose it, and simply because that would be more interesting. 
If witnessing suffering firsthand doesn't spark good deeds, she argues, why do we think art about suffering will? Simulation is not empathy. It's a mutilation of the very concept. If you have to walk a virtual mile in someone's shoes to understand their plight, then you don't have empathy. You have voyeurism. Games cannot conjure empathy in us out of thin air. Because games are not empathy machines. They are mirrors. And you can't see something that isn't already there. Empathy is something you bring to art that affects your understanding of it. It's not something you get from it. When you find Trico in that cave, you've already come to a conclusion about how you feel about their pain. That isn't something the game gave you. And one of the most important things we can learn about empathy is it has its limits. An animal is an animal. We might love an animal, especially a pet, but we can't know their inner thoughts, just as we can't truly know anyone's inner life. The Last Guardian is a story about realizing and accepting that. Trico can't speak to you. His thoughts are not yours to know. The Last Guardian would prefer we didn't treat video games like machines at all. Therein lies the wasted potential of the medium. To treat an art form as resource extraction, person goes in here, empathy goes out there. As has been made abundant and clear in our current age of information overload, exposure simply isn't enough. The game cannot rigidly funnel you through a crash course in the human condition. The secret is to bring in ambiguity and friction, to create spaces for players to explore themselves rather than try to patronizingly prescribe meaningful lessons about others to them. Empathy comes from where our knowledge ends. When we embrace our limits and allow our capacity to care to extend beyond it. The desire for convenience and control over the challenge of collaboration is exactly what the master of the valley represents. And it just so happens that their terrible evil isn't defeated by a sword or a weapon but by a mirror, through reflection, its own spell fed back to itself. And it is that, systems which value control and convenience, which can modify others for its own ends, which throw aside the rich reward of cooperation, that we must vanquish. Thank you for watching. This one took a long while to wrangle together, but thanks to the support of my patrons, I was able to spend the time getting it right. If you enjoyed this video or my others and would like to see my streams or read reviews and other articles, please support me on Patreon. Your name can join the credits as one of the people who make videos like this possible. Next I'll be returning Subtext Adventure to The Witcher 3 to finish my series on it once and for all by covering the game's final expansion, Blood and Wine. Stay tuned for that coming soon. And thank you for watching. <laughs>